demolition. They hang a big tube from the side of an office building. And through this esophagus the size of an elevator shaft, they throw down furniture and wire, chunks of plaster, ceiling tile and glass, shag carpet, track lighting, swivel chairs and lathe, crash and bashing into giant bins five floors below, boring and banging down, and this goes on for seven days. I may be a grown man, but that doesn't mean I don't enjoy the ingenuities of violence against matter, which means I stand across the street with all the other guys, wheelchair vet and hot dog vendor, junior attorney and the retiree, in a little cluster of hypnotized testosterone. I too am made of joists and stanchions, of plasterboard and temperamental steel, mortgage payments and severed index fingers, ex-girlfriends and secret Kool-Aid flavored dawns. We gaze at the destruction and linger the way a woman might go tranced out staring through a window at a too expensive dress. The way that moonlight looks at an island in the middle of the sea. Island untamed and unashamed, touched by the tide. And uh, another kind of social realistic poem dialectical materialism. <clears throat> I was thinking about dialectical materialism in the supermarket, strolling among the Chilean tomatoes and the Filipino pineapples, admiring the Washington state apples stacked in perfect pyramid displays by the ebony man from Zimbabwe wearing the Chicago Bulls t-shirt. I was seeing the whole produce section as a system of cross-reference signifiers in a textbook of historical economics and the fine spray that misted the vegetables was like the cool mist of style imposed on meaning. It was one of those days when interpretation is brushing its varnish over everything, when even the birds are speaking complete sentences and the sun is a brassy blonde novelist of immense accomplishment, dictating her new blockbuster to a stenographer who types at the speed of light and publishes each page as fast as it is written. There was cornbread rising in the bakery department, and in its warm aroma, I believed that I could smell the exhaled breath of vanished Iroquois their journey west and delicate withdrawal into the forests. Whereas by comparison, the coarse-grained wheat baguettes seems to irrepressibly exude the sturdy sweat and labor of 18th century Europe. My God, there is so much sorrow in the grocery store. You would have to be high on the fumes of, of piped-in pan flutes of commodified Peruvian folk music, not to be driven practically crazy with awe and shame, not to weep at the scale of subjugated matter, the ripped up etymologies of kiwi fruit and bratwurst, the roads paved with dead languages, the jungles digested by foreign money. It's the owners, I said to myself, it's the horrible juggernaut of progress, but the cilantro in my hand opened up its bitty, bitter minty ampule underneath my nose, and the bossa nova muzak charmed me like a hypnotist, and the pretty cashier with the shaved head and nose ring said, have a nice day, as I burst with my groceries through the automatic doors into the open air where I found myself in a giant parking lot 
at a mega mall outside of Minneapolis, where in row E87, a Ford Escort from Mankato had just had a fender bender with a Honda from Miami. And those personified portions of my heart, the drivers, were standing there in the gathering Midwestern granular descending dusk, mm -hmm. waiting for the trooper to fill out the accident report. With the rotating red light of the squad car whipping in circles above them, <clears throat> splashing their chopped out middle-aged faces with war paint the hue of cherry Gatorade. And each of them was thinking that with dialectical materialism, accidents happen. How at any minute, convenience can turn into a kind of trouble you never wanted.